Hello, my name is Dr. Firuza Sabri, and I am the chair of the Physics and Material Science Department here at the University of Memphis. Recently, the awards for the Nobel Prize was announced, and the Physics Award went to the area of astronomy. Here at the University of Memphis and the Physics and Material Science Department, we are very fortunate to have a very talented assistant professor, Dr. Francisco Mule Sanchez, who is going to give us an overview of this great accomplishment and really and truly what is this award celebrating. I would also like to introduce Dr. Gustav Borsted who has kindly taken the time to arrange and organize this presentation and interview for you. I hope you enjoy. Hello. This year, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to three astronomers, Dr. Roger Penrose from the University of Cambridge for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction from the general theory of relativity and to Dr. Reinhard Genzel from the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany, and Dr. Andrea Guess from the University of California in Los Angeles for the discovery of a compact, dark, massive object at the center of our galaxy. This is the third time in the past four years that the Nobel Prize in Physics is awarded to astronomers, which indicates that we are living a golden age in astronomy. But this year is special for me because one of the Nobel laureates, Dr. Reinhard Genzel, was my PhD thesis advisor. And for that reason, I'm here today to talk about the science behind the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics, specifically the work of my thesis advisor, Dr. Reinhard Genzel. I would like to mention that the work of Dr. Andrea Guess from the University of California in Los Angeles has been also recognized with the Nobel Prize this year because she obtained similar results to what I am going to show you here today, the results from Dr. Reinhard Genzel. Okay, let's begin. So the theory of general relativity predicts the existence of compact, dark, massive objects that we call black holes. Black hole is defined as a region in a space where the force of gravity is so strong that nothing can escape from it, not even light. Another way to imagine a black hole is just an object with a large concentration of mass inside a very small volume. This volume is essentially zero. If you have a large concentration of mass in a volume that is almost zero, then the density of the object is infinite because density is defined as the ratio of mass divided by volume. If the volume is almost zero, then you have infinite density. Then a black hole is an object with infinite density. It turns out that an object with infinite density has also an infinite escape velocity. The concept of escape velocity is something that we are all familiar here on Earth. If a rocket acquires a velocity larger than 11.2 kilometers per second, then the object can escape the force of gravity of the Earth. It escapes from the Earth, and that is why we use the term escape velocity. Now, the maximum speed that we have measured in nature corresponds to the speed of light, which is approximately 300,000 kilometers per second. Nothing can move faster than light. And that is why not even light can escape from the black hole, because we would need an infinite velocity to escape uh, from the black hole. So a black hole has no volume, but it has a mass. And technically, everything can become a black hole if there is a force that is so strong that could compress that object with a certain mass to a volume that is approaching zero. We can imagine a star like the sun, if it is compressed by gravity to the size of the campus of the University of Memphis, then the star would be a black hole. And the size is not the size of the black hole itself, the size of the University of Memphis, 
because remember that a black hole has no size. We talk about the region that exists around the black hole where matter can still escape the gravitational field of the black hole, and that corresponds to the event horizon. The event horizon of a black hole is defined as the orbit around the black hole where the escape velocity equals the speed of light. In that region, matter can still exist as we know it, and it can still escape from the black hole if it acquires a velocity equal to the speed of light. So we can measure the size of the event horizon using a parameter that we know in physics as the Schwarzschild radius in honor of the person who calculated this radius for the first time, the German scientist Karl Schwarzschild. The surface at the Schwarzschild radius acts as an even horizon in a non-rotating black hole. A rotating black hole operates slightly different, but still the Schwarzschild radius is a good approximation. Neither light nor particles can, can escape through the surface from the region inside the Schwarzschild radius, hence the name black hole. And that is why we can say that in the universe, what happens in the black hole stays in the black hole. It turns out that the Schwarzschild radius is proportional to the mass of the black hole. In other words, if we want to know the size of the even horizon of a black hole, we have to know its mass. And that is why the mass is the most important physical parameter of a black hole. Astronomers are familiar with two types of black holes, stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes. Stellar mass black holes are objects with three to a few tens of solar masses. The solar mass is just the mass of the sun. So a stellar mass black hole with three solar masses, it means that it has the mass of three suns, for example. And supermassive black holes have masses on the order of one million to approximately 10 billion solar masses. They are objects with a large concentration of mass. Stellar mass black holes are the end product of the evolution of massive stars. Massive stars experience gravitational collapse at the end of their lives, which means that all the mass in the core of the star is compressed to a volume that is approximately zero. So it becomes a black hole. Those are the so-called stellar mass black holes. Supermassive black holes, on the other hand, exist at the centers of massive galaxies. We know this because during the past 30, 40 years, we have measured the masses of several supermassive black holes in the universe. But it was Dr. Reinhard Gensel and his team who provided the first, measuring, the first measurement of the mass of a supermassive black hole using very precise data of the stars that are moving around the center of mass of the Milky Way. And that is the importance of the Nobel Prize in Physics this year. They are recognizing the effort of Dr. Reinhard Gensel in showing for the first time that a supermassive compact object exists at the center of the Milky Way, and that its mass and properties are consistent with those proposed by general relativity for a supermassive black hole. And this is a result that was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics this year. This animation shows the stars in the central region of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Dr. Reinhard Gensel measured the velocity of the stars and the orbits of the stars around the center of mass of the Milky Way. In this animation, you can see how the stars are moving around a central dark object that we cannot see because it does not emit light. But we can use Kepler's loss of motion to estimate the mass of the central dark object, and it turns out that it's around 4 million solar masses. This result provides evidence for the existence of a supermassive black hole. And that is the beauty of this experiment. We can use very simple math and physics to estimate the mass of the supermassive black hole. However, 
the technical challenges involved are considerable, requiring sophisticated approaches to both data acquisition and data analysis. So how did Dr. Reinhard Gensel obtain his measurements and the evidence for a supermassive black hole? Well, let us begin at larger scales with our galaxy, the Milky Way. This is an image of the Milky Way seen at infrared wavelengths. We are looking at the galaxy edge on, which means that we are looking at the disk of the galaxy. If we look closer into the central region, we see that it's a crowded region where we can see a lot of stars. And then near the center of mass, which is the center of rotation of all the stars and all the gas around the Milky Way, we see several stars moving in elliptical orbits. But the center of mass is dark. Dr. Ranger Gensel obtained images with very high spatial resolution and over a period of more than 20 years of the individual stars in the galactic center. He measured their orbits and velocities as can be seen in this animation. If we observe in detail the trajectory of the star that is indicated with yellow data points and errors, this corresponds to the orbit of the star S2, the letter S and the number two, and we will see that this star orbits the black hole in a period of approximately 15 years. And we can measure the size of its orbit, which is approximately 300 billion kilometers. That might seem like a big number, but remember that we are talking about um, uh, a region that is very large, I mean, the center of our galaxy. So with these two numbers, the period of the star around the central dark object and the size of the orbit, we can estimate the mass of the central object. And it turns out that applying Kepler's loss of motion to the star S2 and to the other stars that you see here, because Dr. Gensel obtained measurements for all the stars that you see in this field of view, um, all of them are consistent with an object that has a mass of approximately 4 million solar masses. So these measurements provided the evidence for a compact, compact because it occupies a very small region in space that is indicated here with the red cross. It is dark because at the position of this red cross, we do not see any light com coming from the center of mass of the Milky Way. And it's a massive object with a mass of 4 million solar masses. According to general relativity, these characteristics are consistent with the definition of a black hole. And because its mass is in the range of a million solar masses, then we use the term supermassive black hole. This represents the strongest evidence, and that is a gravitational evidence of their existence. Another piece of evidence that is shown here is the existence of flares. A flare is just the sudden production of electromagnetic radiation or light at the position of the compact dark massive object. What you see here in the left panel is two images of the galactic center, one at a time equals zero and another one at time equals 39. This is a random time, and we're not interested here in the units of time. At t equals zero, or time equals zero, we do not see electromagnetic radiation coming from the center of mass of the Milky Way. This is located just right below the star S2. And then at some time, indicated here at t equals 39, we see a flare. That is, we see light coming from the location of the black hole. This light uh, or electromagnetic radiation is present just for a few hours and then it disappears. That region in the space remain black for a long period of time. And these are the so-called flares. 
They occur in several parts of the electromagnetic spectrum from the X-rays to the near infrared. And in these images, uh, I am showing the near infrared flares. But they also appear in the submillimeter and in the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It turns out the flares are also evidence for a black hole. They are interpreted as matter that accumulates around the black hole at random times. Then the matter experiences friction in a disk, and the friction produces electromagnetic radiation. When this process stops, or there is no more matter interacting in hot spots, in, in, in that spots in the accretion disk, then the supermassive black hole does not emit light, uh, or there is no light coming from the location of the black hole. Dr. Gensel performed his experiments at the center of the Milky Way because it's the closest galactic center to the solar system. And he was able to measure for the first time the motion of the stars around a supermassive black hole. But in the future, we will be able to perform this experiment in other galaxies with very powerful telescopes. I believe that the next steps in this field correspond to the characterization of supermassive black holes in other galaxies and different environments. And that is the research that I'm carrying out here at the University of Memphis in collaboration with Dr. Ranghar Gensel and other astronomers. We are trying to characterize the environments around supermassive black holes. This is very important because that has profound implications for our understanding of not only astrophysics, but the laws of physics in general. I would say that there are three important questions that we would like to answer. One of them is related to measuring relativistic effects around a very strong um, gravitational field as the one created by supermassive black holes. We, don't under, we do not understand very well the behavior of matter around very strong gravitational fields, and we can test general relativity and make predictions about how matter will behave around the supermassive black hole. And that is also related to the production of gravitational waves. As an example, I'm showing here an experiment that was performed last year um, by a group of scientists known as the Event Horizon, Event Horizon Collaboration, um, where they obtained the first image of the accretion disk of a supermassive black hole. What you see here in this image in uh, orange and yellow colors is the emission from an accretion disk of the supermassive black hole in the galaxy M87. We can see a ring and a different brightness distribution in the ring because of relativistic effects of matter moving at velocities very close to the speed of light. So this is this image is what was predicted by general relativity. If we perform this experiment or other similar experiments to characterize the matter that is orbiting very close to the supermassive black hole, we can understand better how matter behaves around very strong gravitational fields and test predictions from general relativity. And these are all very important questions in physics. Another important aspect by studying black holes in other galaxies is to understand how supermassive black holes grow and how they influence their host galaxies. We don't know how supermassive black holes are formed, and we don't know how we don't know very well how they grow. So by studying the environment around supermassive black holes, we will be able to make predictions about how supermassive black holes are filled, how the accretion disk is formed, and then how this translates into the production of electromagnetic radiation or charged particles that then they will influence their host galaxies in a meaningful way. These are all topics related to galaxy evolution. And finally, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, we believe that all massive galaxies in the 
massive galaxies in the universe cause supermassive black holes. There exist in the universe mergers of galaxies, which are just two or more galaxies interacting with each other. Eventually, this merger would lead to the merger of the two supermassive black holes. We do not understand how this process occurs, how the two supermassive black holes merge, and how this is related to the production of gravitational waves and the existence of the gravitational wave background. We believe that most of the gravitational waves that exist in the gravitational wave background are produced by the merger of two supermassive black holes. We don't really observe this phenomenon in nature, and it is difficult to make predictions based on observations. Uh, but in the future, this is going to be possible. Uh, it's going to be possible to study the region where these two supermassive black holes from each progenitor galaxy will merge, and we hopefully will understand more about the production of gravitational waves from supermassive black holes. All these topics have profound implications for physics in general and for our understanding of the universe. And I believe that we are going to see in the near future more Nobel Prizes in physics awarded to astronomers working in this field. My name is Dr. Gustav Borsted. I hope that you enjoyed um, Dr. Mueller Sanchez's presentation on the science behind this year's Nobel Prize which as you know, was awarded to Dr. Reinhard Genzel along with two other scientists. Now we have the opportunity um, to learn a little bit more about Dr. Mueller Sanchez along with what it was like to work with Dr. Genzel directly. So Dr. Mueller Sanchez, how did you become interested in physics and astronomy? And um, also, could you tell us about, um, tell us what were some of the factors that led you to pursue a PhD under Dr. Reinhard Genzel's supervision? Yes, <laughs> thank you, Gustav. Well, for me, everything started when I was a kid growing up in Mexico. My family had a small house in a small town outside of Mexico City. And you see, Mexico City is one of the most populated cities in the world. And unfortunately, there is a lot of light pollution. So when you look to the sky at night, you don't see anything, you don't see the stars. In this house, approximately 200 kilometers away from Mexico City, there is no light pollution. So I spent hours looking at the sky at night and I was fascinated with the things that I could see there. I could see many stars, nebula, and even the Milky Way. And this was particularly attractive because it looks precisely as an extended milky patch of sky above the earth at night. Scientifically, this bright patch of light is the result of looking at a concentrated band of billions of different stars in our galaxy behind a large concentration of gas. So it was, um, I was 10 or 11 years old when I realized that I wanted to learn more about space. But it was also at that point when I realized that actually space is physics. So if I wanted to learn more about all the objects in the universe, I would need to take physics. By the time I was 15, um, physics and math were my two favorite subjects. Every day after school, uh, when I come back with a huge pile of homework at home, I would always do my math and physics homework first and I would deal with the massive English or literature say uh, later. And that's how I decided to pursue a career in physics and astronomy. I did my undergraduate studies in Mexico in satellite engineering. And after that, I received a scholarship from the German government to do my PhD in Germany. So I started to look uh, for a PhD program in Germany I talked with uh, several professors, and I had the opportunity to visit 
some of their research groups. And one of my visits was to Dr. Gensel's group at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Munich. At that moment, I decided I wanted to do my PhD there. So I really liked the institute, uh, the infrastructure, the people working under the supervision of Reinhard Gensel, and especially um, the science that they were doing. Um, at that moment, I didn't know much about supermassive black holes, and I didn't know about the possibility of Dr. Gensel's uh, getting the Nobel Prize, but I was impressed by two things. One, they were using a state-of-the-art instrumentation to observe the centers of galaxies, which I thought was fascinating. And second, Dr. Gensel's results on the galactic center, basically the results that I explained in my presentation a few moments ago. I could see that they were um, doing things that no one else was doing in the world at that time. And they are trying to figure out the answers to questions that no one knows the answer to. And I said at that moment, this is exactly what I want to do the rest of my life. Well, thank you for all that background information. Um, it's, it's a fact that I think that many of us who have gone on to study physics have at some point or another really been very interested in astronomy. Um, it's also very popular with the general public. Many people seem to enjoy the beautiful images um, of space captured by telescopes or to reflect on the wonder of celestial objects. So I think there's, um, it's a very common experience. It's, I think it's really part of what makes us human. Um, so to follow up with that, what was it like to work with Dr. Gensel, could you provide some details or anecdotes from your time as a PhD student? Oh, I have to say that I had a fantastic time as a PhD student working under the supervision of Reinhard Gensel. I couldn't have asked for a better supervisor. And I think this is due to three main reasons. Um, first, he's a very experienced researcher and he knows the field very well. He understands the big, the big picture better than most people that I have ever met. Um, when we met during my progress meetings, he would always identify things on my data that I didn't see, or he would suggest a new method or a new analysis to interpret the data. And this is crucial for a PhD student because sometimes you could spend weeks or even months trying to solve a problem Maybe this is uh, not important. Maybe this will lead you to a dead end or it is something that will not help you for your thesis or it is something that has been already published. So having an experienced researcher with a great understanding of the big picture like Dr. Gensel is very important for a PhD student. The other aspect that I think is very important is that he's a very good leader. Um, there is a saying that goes something like this, um, great leaders surround themselves with great people. And Dr. Gensel is surrounded by other excellent scientists, other senior researchers or postdocs who are also involved in the supervision of PhD students. And this is very important for a PhD student because you have very interesting conversations with other more experienced scientists than you and you learn a lot. In addition, he's an exceptional leader because he leads um, by example. All the advices and suggestions that he would give me during my progress meetings, he would implement them in his own research, in his papers, or in his presentations. Um, for example, uh, during my first year as a PhD student, he gave me the advice to read four or, five, four or five papers in the Astro PH every day. Astro PH is essentially an archive for all the astronomy journal articles, but allows uh, free access before the journals publish them. So I could see Dr. Gensel reading these papers every day at the Institute in his office, um, before a seminar, in the coffee area. And it's like they say, um, what you do has far greater impact than what you say. 
and that's why up to this day I still read four or five papers in AstroPH every day. And finally, I think um, he's a very good uh, motivator. He recognizes the work of the students constantly. Um, for example, a few times when I had to give a seminar at the institute and he was in the audience, at the end of the presentation, he would tell me, uh, very good presentation, Francisco, very good work. And that was very motivating for me. Um, it was also motivating that he always tried to support the students with all the things that they needed for their PhDs in terms of uh, computers, software, equipment, or conference travel. So I remember a few times I wanted to join conferences that I thought they would be important for me. And he was always very supportive. Um, he would provide all the economic resources and support that I needed uh, to join these conferences. So thank you for um, sharing those details from your time working with Dr. Gensel. And so now um, considering Dr. Gensel as a person and a scientist, would you tell us what specifically, in your opinion, contributed to his success as a scientist and researcher and you know, led to his eventual recognition as a Nobel Prize laureate? I identify three main characteristics. First is hard work. Um, as Einstein said, genius is 99% hard work and 1% talent or inspiration. So Dr. Gensel um, would arrive early in the morning to the Institute and then he would leave very late. So as a student, um, I used to work uh, at night many times and I believe I never arrived before him to the Institute in the morning. And then in the night, uh, I used to leave around 7, 8 p.m. And sometimes uh, he was still there. I could see um, the light in his office. So I think this is a very important aspect uh, for success. Um, the second characteristic would be passion. He was very passionate about astronomy, physics, and science in general. And I think this is related to the previous point because he loves his work. And as they say, um, do something you love and you will never work again. So he was very passionate about the topic that he was studying and you could see that in his presentations. His seminars were always very interesting. When he started talking, everyone in the audience was captured by the images and the things uh, he was explaining in a very clear way. Um, so the topic of supermassive black holes might sound difficult to a lot of people, but he would explain it in such a way that you would be fascinated and you would feel that you learned um, something new. And the third characteristic I would say is that he's a perfectionist. And perfectionism understood as setting high standards. Um, during my progress meetings, when he identified something that was suspicious to him about my work, he would always say, there is something fishy about this work. And of course, um, that meant to me that I had to produce new results or do a more detailed analysis. Uh, he always encouraged me to move in new directions and to do very good science. So I believe uh, all these characteristics made him a very successful scientist. Well, thank you for sharing your observation of Dr. Gensel and his characteristics. I think it is important to reflect on how we may be able to apply these characteristics to our own lives and to the tasks that we have at hand. Um, I know that you are you know, transmitting these and other lessons to your students, both in the classroom and in your research here at the University of Memphis. So, um, but before we get to that, just how did, after you earned your PhD, what were your next career steps? And also what was your path that eventually led you here to the University of Memphis. After I obtained my PhD, I was convinced that I wanted to follow a career as an astronomer, uh, which means usually you spend time in different institutes around the world doing research as a postdoc. My first postdoctoral position 
was at the um, Institute for Astrophysics in the Canary Islands in Spain. And then I moved to the United States for a second postdoc at the University of California in Los Angeles. And then I had a position as a research associate at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, during my time in Colorado, I received the invitation from the University of Memphis to interview for a tenure track position. I visited Memphis and I fell in love with the city. Um, it's a great city with a lot of history, with the university and the department. Specifically, I like very much two things about the department. First, the professors in the Department of Physics and Material Science are all superb researchers in several areas of physics, and they form a diverse community of excellent people. And I like the diversity of the department a lot. Um, the broad spectrum of cultural and academic background um, at the department, I believe, creates an environment that stimulates new ways of thinking about challenging research topics and gratifying exchanges of ideas. So this is a group of people that I would be getting along well during my professional career. And second, during my interview at the University of Memphis, I could see that all the professors were very excited about the department's interest in expanding its astronomy offerings basically creating an astronomy program. And this is something I like very much because I have the opportunity to be the leader in this transformational phase. I can implement my vision and hopefully I can leave a mark in the University of Memphis and build a strong group that is uh, full of intellectually curious and hardworking students who are willing to explore new methods and new ideas to characterize the environments around uh, supermassive black holes. And who knows, maybe in the future, the next Nobel Prize in Physics would come from the University of Memphis. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, um, that response, detailing your career path and um, how you made it to Memphis. And, we are very um, pleased with what the University of Memphis Physics and Material Science um, Department is doing. Um, so with that, we'll conclude this interview, but we do want to thank, thank you for taking your time to discuss your experiences and provide some of the defining characteristics of Dr. Gensel. Um, it's also, it's, it's really very nice to be able to, in addition to knowing the achievements that led to the award, to also be able to see um, great scientists as human beings too. So mm -hmm. thank you for your time yes. and thank you for um, sharing. Yeah, thank you for your attention.